Hi guys, welcome to Beer School. Uh, today I'm down at my favourite local Southampton Arms, an amazing real ale pub. Uh, and I'm here for one very good reason, that's to explain to the rest of the world why our warm flat beer is neither warm nor flat, it is some of the best beer you will ever drink. Real Ale is almost unique in the UK, and lines up among great British cliches such as bad teeth and the fact we apologise a lot. Sorry if that offended anyone. Real ale or cast beer is basically the beer that our ancestors drank. It's brewed in the same way but not stored under pressure like keg beer, so it has to be hand pumped up from the cellar. It's also served at room temperature, by which we mean about 12 degrees or 55 Fahrenheit, so still a damn cold room. And as it's naturally carbonated by yeast during fermentation, it's also not served as fizzy as keg beer. Because of this, it often tastes more malty than hoppy because it's less effervescent and aromatic. That means it's not half as trendy as hoppy keg beer, but believe it or not, it's where craft beer started in the UK, with micro cast breweries springing up from as early as the 80s after bastard corporate lager nearly killed them all off. My favourite local, the Southampton Arms, has been serving brilliant real ale for six years, so I went down there to find out how they took the power back. So I'm here with Ash, landlord of the Southampton Arms uh, and gatekeeper of endless, endless real ale. Uh, I guess the first question is, why did you decide to do a real ale pub? I think, you know, the creativity in the beer market started to happen. Everyone's sick of the, the big corporate, you know, bland tasting beer available, you know, granddad beer, like I call it. Yeah. Uh, and there was some, some people started to kick it off marble and, you know, meantime, doing their thing at a time. And so what on earth made you think, I'll tell you what, we'll have ten of them? <laughs> well, it started with eight. Right. Because it was quite a risky start. Yeah. You know, nobody's really sure if that would work that many, um, especially being a little community pub like this. Um, and then within a week or two, suddenly realised that it was going to work. So what does it take to look after 10 beers? Because obviously real ale is basically alive. Yeah, it takes a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a lot of care and attention, a lot of running up and down stairs, checking them. Uh, I mean, we turn, you know, you turn over a lot here as well, so you have to kind of create new inventive ways of uh, getting them to be on form on time. Mm. Uh, yeah, it is a lot of work. So if it's so damned hard to look after and not really suited to super hoppy beers, why do people still brew it and serve it? Firstly, because of people with really long beards. But secondly, because it's got one great advantage over keg beer. When it's poured, it's basically brewery fresh. Before keg beer, we didn't know how to kill off the yeast and stop the beer fermenting without it going off. So beers were delivered alive to pubs and left in the pub cellar until ready. It's producing alcohol right up to the moment that it hits your stomach whereas a keg beer stopped days before you drank it. That means if it's well looked after by the pub, you'll get super fresh, full flavoured beer. But how do you know when a beer is absolutely ready? So take me through, like when you receive a beer from a brewery and it's, you know, it's not sort of quite finished, is it? It's yeah. not ready to serve. So what we'll, do? We'll, uh, we have two tiers of mm -hmm. staff. So we have one that's serving, which has been coming from the brewery, rested for a little while, it's been there for about a week. Then we line it up, give it a good old shake rack it up, leave it for a day if possible, um, then open it, give it some venting time. That should be anything for 24 hours, but yeah, I mean, and each beer has its own character. Something can be ready in a couple of hours and be full flavor. Something can take two days, you know, to be absolutely spot on. So we're down in the cellars, which is where you, you condition your beers. Yep. Um, what are we holding here? Uh, so we've just drawn off a bit of uh, Magic Rocks high wire uh, that's actually venting. So this is doing the last part of the brewing process, mm -hmm. conditioning. Uh, and we'll be checking it for its clarity, it's like the first most simple thing to do. Fairly clear, it's kind of 90% there. Then it smells aroma, you get all those fruity hops coming through. It smells gorgeous. Yeah, it does. <laughs> uh, and then just have a little taste, you know, just double check it. Just. So if this beer was just you just started venting it, what yeah. would what would be smelling different? It'd be a lot flatter. Right. Um, yeah, you wouldn't get as much aroma. You get you'd get the hops coming out still, mm. um, but but just in a big blast, there wouldn't be a nice balance to it. Yeah, because um, it's tempered with a bit of sweetness here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, yeah, it's it's so much harder to be somebody looking after cask because you've got to know exactly what that beer is meant to sort yeah. of taste like. Yeah. Whereas with the keg, it comes in, you tap it, it's done, you go, and <laughs> yeah. you know it's down to the brewery how good it is. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think that's a very important thing about cash. You do have to, you know, have a care and attention towards it, and have a, have a pride in it because you are, you know, some guys have made this stuff lots of hard work, and if we screw it up, 
yeah, that's the final taste that somebody gets. So the chances are, if you haven't enjoyed a cast beer, you may well have been served one that's either not ready or possibly too ready. Even a hophead like me loves a good session strength pale or dark multi porter on cask. It goes well beyond heritage. This style of serving survived because it makes for a rounded flavour and a gorgeous tannic bitter sweetness. My advice though is to ask the barman for a little sample before you buy a pint, just so you know it's tasting good that day. So that's uh, a very quick guide to real ale. I think part of the, the craft explosion has caused cask to get a million times better. Have you sort of yeah. seen that in the past couple of years? Yeah, it's crazy. We've been here six years and it was very hard to get a good beer. Mm. You know, there was, a, there was a few hanging around, but now it's just, you know, inundated. 20 phone calls every Monday from, you know, got a new brewery, we've got, we've got this new beer we're doing, it's completely different now. And, and the quality's gone up as well? Yeah. Incredibly, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's beers that, you know, we used to drink, you know, um, like Pale Ale, it would be called a Hoppy Pale Ale five and a half, six years ago, that, you know, then got surpassed by another beer, and you stop buying that, and then another brewery comes along, and it's just up the state, and it is just constantly. Like changing. So why is keg growing faster than cask in the UK? A lot of people like the, as I said before, the aggressiveness that comes from the keg. And that's my work, but I do find it, it's very, everything's really pronounced and kind of separate. I think in a cask it's all it comes together. together, yeah, it's all mixed together. As well. and do you think that partially comes from the fact it's still alive, it's still as fresh as it can be? Yeah, I mean really, I, really, you know, it's probably the freshest because it's, coming straight, you know, as long as the pub has treated it well and it's mm. been served correctly. Some more experimental people are brewing or selling cask beer around the world, but not everyone has discovered its rounded flavour and balance. But until they do, it's more for the rest of us. I'll go to the bar. <laughs>